we are in the final stretch. I mean, we are just a couple of chapters away from being done, only a few more weeks. Now, because of that, we have to make sure that we have this, so we need everybody's participation today. Are you ready? Okay. All right, well, we are studying the book of Revelation because there is a rumor, even in this town, there are those who are saying that the book of Revelation is... But O oh, contraire, say we, for you see, the word revelation itself means that something has been revealed. Absolutely. If God wanted to conceal something, he would have called it the concealation, not the revelation. And what is it that's revealed in this book? Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the opening line says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so what we find in this book is that it's going to be a revelation of Jesus and from Jesus. And so what we're going to find in this book is that Jesus is revealed not as he was 2,000 years ago, but as we would encounter him today, we might say in his eternal glorified state. And so God so wanted his people to take the time to read this book that he promised that for those who take the time to read this book, they would receive a very special blessing. blessing. And that blessing is found in Revelation chapter verse Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, it says, blessed is he who reads. Now, this is the only book of the Bible that has this phrase. It's only here. This is the only book of the Bible that says, read me, I'm special. It says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. So it would be odd for us to believe in a God who would say, I'll bless you if you read it. I want you to hear it. I want you to heed it. But here's the thing, you'll never understand it. It'd be odd for us to believe in a God like that. But God so wanted us to understand this book, and he knew that there'd be people going around saying that the book of Revelation is hard to understand, so to make this book understandable, God placed in this book its very own outline. outline. And that outline is found in Revelation chapter, verse Revelation 1, 19. This is the only book of the Bible that comes with its own outline. Revelation chapter 1, 19, John is told, therefore write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. Three divisions in the book of Revelation. Write the things that you have seen. So what has John seen up to this point in Revelation? Well, verse 13, it says, in the middle of the lamp stands, I saw one like a son of man. And it goes on to give an incredible description of Jesus as we would encounter him now. But then it says, write the things which are. Now, the things which are pertain to the time period that you and I will call the church age. Church age. And that is found in Revelation chapters, two and three. Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches. Uh, what we find is that those churches literally existed, but what we also find is that in their order, those churches lay out 2,000 years of church history with incredible precision. If you reverse the order of any of the churches, it makes absolutely no sense. But in their order, they lay out 2,000 years of church history. Now, it's important to, today to, to just highlight that Jesus, as he writes these letters to these churches, uh, today we're going to see how one church in church history is a church that he's going to talk about uh, even in the book of Revelation, and we'll see that as we go. So he says, write the things that you have seen, which is the, the, uh, the, or the things that are, which pertain to the church age, but then he says, write the things which will take place after these things. So that phrase, after these things, will be found once again in Revelation chapter, verse Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, let's look at it. Everybody turn to chapter 4, verse 1, and it says, after these things. This is the third division in the book of Revelation. After what things? Well, after chapters 2 and 3, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. Again, very important for our study today. After these things, I looked, John says, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. And so this, again, is the third division in the book of Revelation. The Holy Spirit is so concerned to make sure that we don't miss that this is the third division, that he begins the verse with the phrase, after these things, and he ends the verse with the phrase, after these things. And as you've heard me say so many times before, this is a picture of what you and I will call the rapture of the church. John sees a door standing open in heaven. 
a voice like a trumpet. The voices come up here, and immediately John is in heaven. And as we studied chapters 4 and 5, we found that the entire church is there with John around the throne in heaven. One of the other things that we notice is that when the church goes up, chapter 4, verse 1, although the word church will be mentioned over 20 times in the first three chapters of Revelation, there's going to be one word that's going to be glaringly absent from chapter 4, verse 1, to the end of the book. And that word that's going to be glaringly absent is going to be the word church. church. And the reason being is that the church is no longer here, part of the story on the ground. Um, So the church goes up, and uh, what comes down? Wrath. Wrath. And that is found in Revelation chapter chapter 6, verse 16. Let's look at it. So this is that opening volley of that time period known as the tribulation. And uh, it's that seven-year time period, and we've walked our way through that. But in that opening volley, now that tribulation time period begins in chapter 6, but we always go to verse 16, and it says, they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. He who sits on the throne is a reference to God the Father, and then it says, and from the wrath of the Lamb. The Lamb is always a reference to Jesus. And they are surprised to find that one day his wrath is poured out on a world that has been hostile to him. Many people are uncomfortable with God pouring out his wrath on a world that has been hostile to, to him and his. So we always remember that before verse 16, there's always verse 9. Let's look at it. Verse 9, it says, when the lamb, that's Jesus, broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar, and this is going to be in heaven, the souls of those who had been slain, they'd been killed, because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they maintain. In that time period of the tribulation, there's going to be those who are coming to Jesus, and, uh, and yet the world is still going to be very hostile to him, and it's going to cost them their lives. Just as you are passionate about your children, God is very passionate about his children, and there comes a time when he says, enough is enough. Well, we have been going through uh, this book of Revelation, and I want you to turn all the way to chapter 17, chapter 17. And uh, we've gone through that seven-year tribulation all the way through the end, and we've been looking at that at the last uh, couple of chapters. But there's something else that's been going on that God waited to the very end of the book to tell us about. And uh, we're going to talk about that today. We're also going to find um, why, through much of church history, we've been told, you know, the book of Revelation is allegorical, it's mystical, don't spend time there. Today we'll see why much of the church has said that. Also, let me say that um, chapter 17 is a chapter that people write books on. I only have a few minutes to go through this. So I want to give you enough, uh, but but keep in mind there's a whole lot more. And again, people write books about this. I'm going to share today what those who study Bible prophecy conclude that this is about. Most people do not study Bible prophecy. Most of us grew up in a church that never talked about Bible prophecy. Sometimes Bible prophecy can be a a little bit uncomfortable, as is the case today. So I also want to say that I'm sharing what most people who actually study Bible prophecy conclude, but if somebody comes and they say, I disagree with you on this, I'm going to look at them and say, okay, Uh, I'm okay with that. And just so you know, if I'm wrong on this, I don't think I'm wrong on this, but but if I am, nothing would make me happier than being wrong on this, because this is very uncomfortable. We are going to find that there is an institution that has been very prevalent during the church age. It's also going to be very prevalent during that time period known as the tribulation. We're going to find that this institution, when you look at its very top, uh, the leadership are not actually 
believers, and uh, we'll talk about that as we go. We're also going to look at a term that uh, you might have heard. Uh, some of your Bibles will say a little bit more graphically, it will call this person that we're going to look at the whore of Babylon. Does that sound fun? I uh, know. <laughs> My Bible says the great harlot. We're going to go with the great harlot today. <laughs> because I don't want to feel like I have to wash my mouth out with soap every time it's mentioned. So just so you know that on the uh, front end, various groups throughout history have called each other the whore of Babylon. Uh, right now, Mormons call us the whore of Babylon and other groups called. So, so, groups, so don't just pick on that. Everybody calls somebody else, you know, that. So, so today, instead of calling a bunch of people that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what the Bible says and let the Bible tell us. Okay, so that's what, what we're going to be doing. Now, you want to keep in mind that this is in the second half of that time period called the tribulation, and uh, there's going to be one religious group in this time period and also in our time period now that's going to seek to unite all religions, all religions. On the top of your outline, I've given, given you a little bit of an assignment today, when you go home today, get on the computer, and I want you to type in Chrislam, Chrislam. And uh, Chrislam is the mixture of Christianity and Islam. It's also the mixture of just about every other religion. And there is one world leader uh, who professes to represent Jesus who is advocating for Chrislam or the unification of, of all these religions. I will let you do some research, and you look that up and uh, see see where you wind up. So chapter 17 is going to tell us who we're talking about, but verse 9 is going to tell us where the headquarters will be of uh, this religion in this time period of the tribulation. So everybody go over to chapter 17, verse 9. And uh, verse 9, it says, now here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, some of your Bibles might say hills, on which the woman sits. And so uh, we're going to find out that this is the city of seven hills. And uh, so the word there for hills, some of your Bibles, hills or mountains, there in your outline, the seven heads or the seven hills, oros, on which the woman sits. Same word, and Jesus would use another way. He says, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So uh, she's going to sit on these seven hills. Now, we're also going to be told that this city of seven hills, or this woman sits on these seven hills, this is also a certain city. So I want you to look down at verse 18, and in verse 18, it's going to say, the woman whom you saw is the great city, and so you want to underline that, which reigns over the kings of the earth. So she sits on the seven hills, and those seven hills are the city, we would say the city of seven hills. Does that make sense? So the city of seven hills in the Bible and throughout history, the one that's most commonly known is, is always a reference to what city? Rome. Rome. So you want to write that down. Now, before you think that this is some angry, wacky Protestant's perspective, um, all you have to do is pull out your handy-dandy, pocket-sized Catholic encyclopedia <laughs> and open up to where it talks about Rome, and here, here's just what it says. Just to let you know, this is not my definition. And it says, within the city of Rome, called the city of seven hills, that the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confined. So, so the, that everybody gets that this is speaking of Rome or the city of seven hills. Well, going on from there, you will recall and I mentioned this a few minutes ago, in chapters two and three, Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches. And we talked about how those churches lay out 2,000 years of church history with incredible precision. If you reverse the order, it makes no sense. There was one church that emphasized a woman. And uh, the name of that church was called Thyatira. Uh, there on your outline, you could say Thuatira, or you can say the uh, tiara, and uh, we'll talk about that. Now, thua means that it's in the feminine. So you have the word thugater, that's the Greek word for daughter. So the thu makes it for, uh, feminine. The tiara means it's a crown, a crown. Uh, a tiara is a crown that a woman wears. You guys know this, right? 
A tiara is a crown that a woman wears. So literally the name of this church is the female crown. And um, what you find is that uh, this church, um, well, let me just say this. This church is all about a woman and it's all about a female crown. Now, if you look up any English dictionary and you type in the word tiara, what you'll see is that the word tiara in English comes from this word tiara from the Greek and the Latin. So this is not a stretch. Any Greek or any uh, English dictionary would tell you. So there is a world religious leader who wears the crown, we would say, of the woman. So if you take your Catholic encyclopedia and you just simply go to the word tiara, it will just simply say this. The diadem that the Pope wears at his coronation and at other solemn non-liturgical ceremonies is known as the tiara. It's just simply a female crown. Uh, male crowns aren't called tiaras. That's a crown of the woman. So far, so good? So here is this church. And by the way, and this will be important for our study, um, this town, Thyatira, earlier this town had another name, and the name was Semiramis. Does everybody see that? Which just means the queen of heaven, queen of heaven. Now, so Jesus writes to this church and this church is all about a woman, and they've left being about the Son of God, and so he has to remind them who he is. And you can get the teaching we did on this. We took a whole week and talked about this way back when in chapter 2. But here's what Jesus says. He says, the Son of God says this to this church, the Thyatira, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. Now, you want to underline that. Uh, he calls her Jezebel. They think she's somebody else. But from his perspective, she's Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. And we'll talk about that. And to eat things sacrificed to idols. That word idols, by the way, you can also translate as statues. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her will go into great tribulation. And you want to underline that. This is the only church that's ever told that they would wind up going into the great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Now, here's the part. How many of you grew up as Baptists? Okay, you need to hear this next part. It's very important. He says, he says, now I say to you, still speaking to this church, to you and to the rest in Thyatira, they're part of that church. He says, as many as do not have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan as they say. He says, I will put no other, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast to what you have until I come. Now what he's saying there is that in that church, there are many believers who love Jesus just like we love Jesus. And they're in that church. He's not talking about them. He says to them, you just hold on, hold to what you have until I come. So uh, that's important if you come from a background like I come from. So, so you have this woman, Jezebel. So who is Jezebel and what was her great sin? Well, Jezebel in the Bible was the only pagan queen who married a Jewish king. And what took place is that um, there's this piece of property and she wants to get that for Ahab, her husband. So she goes to this person who has the property and she has some people, and they bring about some false accusations. Nabal is the, uh, the owner of the property. He's a believer, and he's doing what the Bible says. And so she brings false accusations against him. She has him stoned to death, and then she takes his property. And so the property becomes the, the king or the queen. And so that is a picture when this church came about. There was something, if you ever take a, a course in church history, it's called the Inquisition. Now, the Inquisition is a very sad time in church history. It goes from the 1200s to about the 1800s. It was the time where, sadly, uh, people were accused. They were accused of things like reading the Bible in their own language. Uh, they were accused of heresy, all, all of these things by the Catholic Church. They were accused. There was nothing they could do to ever prove their innocence. And then they were put to death in horrific ways. Some were drowned, some were burned. You know, and you can read the stories of, of those things. It's a terrible, terrible time. But in all cases, their property was confiscated 
by the Roman church. It's called the Inquisition. Now, in all fairness, just so you know, every pope in the past 50 years acknowledges that that took place. And they also say it's a terrible time in church history. They're embarrassed by it, and uh, they wish there was a way that the church could distance themselves from it because it actually took place. Well, you notice it also says in that church that they are involved in sexual immorality. Now, what we're going to find in a minute is that when he speaks of sexual immorality and speaks to a church, he's referring to things like spiritual immorality. We'll talk about that. Again, the only church that's told that they're going to go into the Great Tribulation, and the good news is that there are many believers in that church. But then he says to them, he says, those of you who don't hold to the deeper things of Satan, you just hold on to what you have until I come. For them to hold on to what they have until Jesus comes means that whatever church this is has to be in existence when Jesus comes. So they'll still be in existence. So far, so good? So we're going to pick up our story here in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 17. And let the Bible tell us uh, what we're talking about here. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot, we're going to go with what my Bible says here, great harlot, underline that, who sits on many waters, we'll talk about that, with whom the kings of the earth, underline that, committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So she's called the great harlot, the great prostitute. Some of yours are a little bit more graphic. But harlot or prostitute in the Bible is always used or many times used as an idiom for idolatry, and you want to write that down. So for instance, back in Jeremiah, God says this, the Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there, underline, played the harlot. So they didn't sell their bodies. What they were doing was worshiping another God. They just weren't giving their attention to God, but they were giving their attention somewhere else. God feels about idolatry or the worship of another God the way that you would feel if you found that your spouse was having an affair. And so that's that's how he refers to that. But we notice there in verse 1, it says, we underline that she sits on many waters and with whom the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality. So when it says she sits on many waters, what does that mean? Well, I want you to go all the way over to verse 15, verse 15. And in verse 15, it it just simply says, he said to me, the waters on which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And so What you find here, people, nations, tongues, many, many kings and all that, you want to write down whoever this is, they have a worldwide influence, a worldwide influence. She's been around long enough to have a worldwide influence and many kings throughout 2,000 years, I'd say, have participated with the things that she's doing. Verse three, he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman, same woman, sitting on a scarlet red beast, and that's going to be the Antichrist, full of blasphemous names and having seven heads and ten horns. So basically, and you want to write this down, she is riding the beast, the guy that we would call the Antichrist. So you want to write that down. And uh, when you, you know, when you, you ride a horse, the idea is you think you're steering. But what we're going to find out is she thinks she's steering, she's leading, but he's using her. And we'll see that as we go. Verse 4. It says the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, or red. Go ahead and underline that. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. So a couple of things you want to write down. First of all, she's wealthy and attractive. We saw the things that she's adorned to convey that she's very, very wealthy. She's attractive. Uh, whatever she's doing, there's been kings who've wanted to participate in, in uh, the things that she's doing. Uh, it says she's a harlot, and the idea is she's selling something, and uh, people want to be part of it. And so God says that she's, uh, he uses the word immorality, 
And so from God's perspective, whatever she's about, it's from his perspective, it's immorality. Now, it's also uh, interesting that the two colors that he identifies there are purple. Now, purple was always the color of the Roman Senate. It, it, was, uh, it implied wealth. It was a hard, hard color to come by 2,000 years ago. And then scarlet, which just means red, and that means uh, royalty in, in those days. So purple and red, basically. So right now, purple and red, or scarlet, are the official colors for who? The Pope, the Pope. And so you can look that up. That's not a stretch in any way. Now, it's also the official colors for the Presbyterians, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> so however far you want to run with that. So uh, great friends, Presbyterians. So verse 5, it says, Now on her forehead was written a mystery. Now you want to underline a mystery. Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Babylon the great, but it's a, it's a mystery. So what we're going to find is that she's located in Rome, write this down, but mystically Babylon, mystically Babylon. When you study the Bible, you find that the Bible is a story of two cities. The city that's mentioned most in the Bible is the city of Jerusalem, but the city that's mentioned second most is the city of Babylon. Now, Babylon is an interesting story, and she's the mother of harlots. So where does that all come from? Well, that all begins back in chapter 11 of Genesis. Now, in chapter 11 of Genesis, there was a guy named Nimrod on the plain of Shinar. Now, Shinar is in modern-day Iraq. And uh, his name, Nimrod, just means he will rebel. That's what his name means. And Nimrod wants to build what's called the Tower of Babel. How many of you remember that story? Remember that story? Now, Babel just means the gate of heaven or heaven's gate. He wants to build a gateway up to heaven. Later, Babel would just be called Babylon, Babylon. So Babel and Babylon are the same exact thing. So this Nimrod, when you read the story, is a mighty hunter but he's a mighty hunter, and it says, in defiance of the Lord. Well, Nimrod, as the legend goes, takes a wife, and her name is Semiramis. Do you remember Thyatira, what it was originally called? It was called Semiramis. Well, Nimrod takes this wife, and uh, he goes hunting, and as the story goes, he's killed on a hunting trip by a wild boar. Well, 40 days after Nimrod has died, Semiramis, his wife, finds that she's pregnant. Now, it won't be a virgin birth, but she realizes she hasn't actually been with anybody in 40 days, and here she is pregnant. She concludes that she is pregnant by Nimrod. But not only is she pregnant by Nimrod, she believes she's pregnant with Nimrod. So Nimrod will be both the father and the son. So she's very excited about being pregnant. And so what she does is she takes a golden egg to celebrate fertility. And, uh, and then those who begin to follow as this becomes a religion, uh, they, they begin to, to celebrate her fertility. They begin to take eggs and they begin to color those eggs. Later on, in another language, that celebration will be called Ishtar, and they will celebrate that by taking eggs and coloring them different colors. Does that sound at all familiar to anybody? <laughs> yeah, vaguely, maybe. So, so, so the son is born, and he has miraculous powers according to their religion. Now, that was Nimrod, but you know, in different cultures, different languages, it's the same religion, but it's going to be pronounced a little bit differently, so just because it's a different religion. So in the Canaanite religion, you remember Israel goes into the land of Canaan, they're celebrating the thing, same thing, but they don't call him Nimrod, they call him Baal. We don't say Baal, we say Baal, Baal. And the woman, her name is Ashtaroth, Ashtaroth. And so what they find, according to their religion, one day in the dead of winter, the child dies. But three days later, he's miraculously resurrected. And people begin what they call 
uh, mother and child worship, mother and child worship. Semiramis takes the title, the queen of heaven. The Old Testament people, the Jewish people, begin to take their focus away from God, and they begin to look at what they are calling the queen of heaven, and this is so offensive to God that God tells Jeremiah, and I put this verse there in your outline, he says, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women need dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven, underline that, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. Does everybody see that? So from God's perspective, this is very offensive. So in the original, back in Genesis, uh, it would be Semiramis and Nimrod. In the Canaanite religion, same religion, but it's just called Baal and Ashtaroth. Now the Greeks, they just called the same religion uh, Horus and Isis. But the Romans called her Venus, and the boy was called Cupid. Have you ever noticed that Cupid is always a baby boy? It's the same religion. It's just a different culture and a different language. Does that make sense? So in the first 300 years of Christianity, the church is persecuted. But in the late 300s, uh, Constantine becomes the emperor and he issues what's called the Edict of Toleration. What that means is that Christianity last week was outlawed. This week, it's the official religion of the empire. Well, it's at that time something happens in Christianity that never happened in the first 300 years. Mother-child worship comes into the church, comes into the church. Here, it's called Mystery Babylon. The woman is in Rome, but her influence has been all the way back since Nimrod in uh, Genesis chapter 11. Do you find that interesting? So verse 6, we notice it says, And I saw the woman drunk, you want to underline that, with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, two groups. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Some of your Bibles will say astonished. Now, what we find here is whoever this woman is, you want want to write this down, she's not just responsible, but she's drunk on their blood. She's drunk on their blood. Sadly, sadly. Um, If you look at church history and uh, you look at the Inquisition, you look at some of the things that took place. Um, On August 24th, 1572, the Catholic armies came in and they wiped out 70,000 French Huguenots. So who are French Huguenots? French Huguenots would be called French Calvinists, the early part of the Presbyterian church. They didn't have armies. They killed the the Huguenots professing to be Christians, but they were killed in the name of Christ because they weren't part of the Catholic Church. By the way, if you want to have some fun today, go and look up the French Huguenots who were killed in Florida a few hundred years ago and who came in and killed them even here in Florida, what religion that was. Now, my point is uh, every pope will admit that this happened and, uh, and they will say, it's a horrible time in church history. And they're embarrassed by it. They want to distance themselves. But, but the fact is it, it actually happened. So every, every, every pope admits that. So this woman is apparently also going to be prevalent in that tribulation period. She kills two groups. One are the saints. Most people believe that those are the saints in the tribulation, but then those who would be the martyrs of Jesus, and that would be before that time period of the tribulation. But I want you to notice the last part of verse 6. The last part of verse 6. He sees her. She's drunk in the blood of the saints. And my translation, it says, I wondered greatly. Now, how many of your Bibles say, I was greatly astonished? That's a better translation. Now, why? Well, If this was the government of Rome, this would not be astonishing to John. John was writing this by being exiled on the island of Patmos. The Roman government had been killing Christians throughout this time. He wouldn't be astonished by that at all. Apparently, what's astonishing to him as he looks at this, it appears that whoever she is, 
is killing Christians, those who claim to follow Jesus, but she's doing it in the name of Christ. And that's why it's so astonishing. Well, verse 7, it goes on. And uh, let me just say before we get into this, did I mention that people write books about this? So there's a whole lot more. I can just give you a little bit, but you need to go and, and look at a lot more, more than we can give today. So verse 7, it says, And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast. The beast is always the Antichrist that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And the beast which you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss, we'll tell you where he really comes from, and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Could God make it any more clear? All right, so here's, what, here's what's going on. Um, whoever this beast is, that Antichrist, the first thing that we're going to notice is he existed before John. He's not currently existing, at least not in the human form in John's time, but he will be in the future. I'm going to suggest that this is possibly going all the way back to Nimrod, and we'll see that as we go. Now, verses 9 through 11. I'm going to read it in my translation, then we're going to read it from the, the NIV. Verse 9, it says, here is the mind which has wisdom. The idea is you're going to have to think this one through. The seven heads are the seven mountains or hills on which the woman sits. We've talked about that. And, if your Bible says and, you want to underline that however your Bible says it because it's going to tell you they're not just that, they're also something else. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is... The other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast, which was not, is himself also an eighth, he'll be at the end, and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. So, um, first of all, she's riding on a specific location. We know that location to be Rome. Write that down, Rome. Now, some of your Bibles will use the word hills. Some will use the word mountains. I, I like how the NIV says it. It says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. And then I've underlined, they are also seven kings. So on the one hand, they're hills, but there's more to this prophecy than meets the eye. They're also going to represent some kings. We might say kingdoms. It says, five have fallen, the other has not yet come. But when he does, or five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. So let me give you the breakdown of this, and I encourage you to do some study, and uh, you, you, you can find a great deal of information. The hills and the mountains are also kings, and you want to write that down. They're also kings. The first five have fallen, and that would be in the past. That would be before John wrote. When you go through the Bible, the Bible lays out history. It lays out kingdoms. So you go all the way back, and the first, uh, as Israel became a nation, the first world kingdom that was associated with Israel, because this is all going to be uh, uh, associated with the Bible and, and Israel. The first one was Egypt. That's the first. Assyria was the second. Babylon was the third. Medo-Persian was the fourth, Greece, Greece was the fifth, and uh, Rome was the sixth. But five have fallen, so the first five have fallen. But one currently is, and from John's standpoint, that was Rome. So you want to write that down. It was Rome. One has not yet come. That's going to be in the future, even the future from us. The beast will be the eighth, but he's also one of the seventh. And you want to write that down. When that last kingdom comes, again, this is such a short version. When that last kingdom arises, one is going to come out of that kingdom. He's going to be the Antichrist. It will be the seventh kingdom, but he will be the eighth as he takes over that kingdom. Verse 12, it says, The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have 
not yet received a kingdom. You want to underline that? But they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour or one time period. So these 10 kingdoms are in the future. You want to write that down? That's still even in the future from us. It's on its way. But here's what happens when he comes and they come into being. And it, we're going to have this preview here of Armageddon. Verse 13, it says, these have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the lamb. It's always a reference to Jesus. And the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And those who are with him, which is going to be us, are the called and the chosen and the faithful. Called, chosen, and the faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are the peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. By the way, verses 13 and 14, they wage war against the Lamb. He destroys them. The last few chapters as we've gone through the second half of the tribulation always end with the reference to this battle of Armageddon. I'll say it slightly different each time, but it's the same battle. Verse 15, let me read it again. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. She has a worldwide influence. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. May God bless to us the reading of his word. <laughs> the, the idea here is that she thinks she's writing. And when you look up Chris Lam today, when whoever this is tries to unify all of these religions, in the end, she's going to find out that they all really hate her and that they're going to destroy her in the end. Well, then it goes on in verse 17. Here's why. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose, by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. Then verse 18. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So did you find that interesting today? So if what we saw today is true, can you see why it would be very common uh, for people to say, whatever you do, stay away from the book of Revelation. You don't want to read that. It's all allegorical. You can't really take it too, too literal uh, because it lays out some things that can be very incriminating. What I appreciate about the Bible is that when it's God's word, it lays out truth. Have you noticed that God never tries to be politically correct? And he doesn't try to be polite, but he always tries to give truth. He wants to give truth. Always keep in mind, if our assumption is right about who that is, also keep in mind there are many people in that church who love Jesus very, very much. And they will be going to heaven in the rapture just like us. But that institution that's trying to unify all the world religions, uh, we're going to see, uh, it's going to go through that, that time. Well, uh, with that, we're going to close there, and we'll pick it up next week. And uh, I'm a Christian today. Like many of you, I grew up in church. And when I went to college, I started encountering some professors who seemed like it was their duty to destroy any hope of faith I ever had. And I went through a, a real time of wilderness, you might say, of questioning and wondering. But when I discovered Bible prophecy and the incredible accuracy of everything that the Bible says, I became convinced because the Bible is the only book on the planet, the only religious book, you might say, on the planet that is built completely on prophecy. That is, God says I'm going to tell you how it's going to happen. It's going to happen just like I said it, and that's how you're going to know that it's true and it's me. When I began learning about Bible prophecy, it solidified my faith to the point where I, I'm beyond convinced, beyond convinced of the truth of this book, the truth of him, the truth of salvation, the truth of Jesus. And if you're here today, and, and you haven't come to that place 
where you've said, Jesus, I, I want you. The entire book is God reaching out to man, mankind saying, I created you because I wanted a relationship with you. I'll show you how it's going to happen, but you've got to come to me. And he won't force you. He won't force you. But he'd love to have you as one of his kids. That's why he created you. Parents, would you agree that you had kids because you, you wanted to be able to invest in them? You wanted to be able to love them? You wanted to see them grow up and maybe not make the same mistakes that you've made? Did any of you parents ever have a child and you go, I can't wait to mess this one up? <laughs> I mean, we, we haven't got it all right, but our intention was always to do our very best. And, and God created you because he wanted to have a relationship with you. He didn't have to create you, but he did because he wanted to have that relationship with you. But you have to want that with him. And just like a good parent, he wants to see you do great in life. He wants to see you to avoid all the, the things that'll mess up your life. And he wants to see you win, just like you wanna see your kids win. As we close in prayer, you have the opportunity to invite him in and have that relationship with him. And you'll never, ever, ever meet someone who's walked with the Lord for any length of time He'll say, that was the dumbest decision I ever made. Doesn't happen. So you have that opportunity right now. Let's pray. Fathers, we wrap this up right now. Lord, here's what we pray. For those of us who haven't come to that place where we've invited you in, you've given us the invitation, but we haven't said yes on our end. We just say, Jesus, I want you. I, I don't have it all figured out, but I want that relationship with you. And I'm, I'm willing to start. And so I'm inviting you to come in. Thank you for forgiving me of everything I've ever done. I want to know you. And I want to be yours. And he says, if you invite him in, he comes in and he never leaves. You'll never regret that decision. Let somebody know that you've made that decision today. Father, for all of us here, we recognize that we live in a very unique time and our world is changing. And so we ask that you would give us the empowerment and the wisdom to represent you well in this time and place where you've allowed us to be. Help us to represent you well. I pray, God, that you keep us till we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Well, God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next time. <laughs>